In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 2656. Matthew 2656. But all this happened so that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. And the scriptures of the prophets were fulfilled to a T, uh, such as Isaiah chapter 53. Then all the disciples left him and ran away. And remember from verse 35 how they were all uh, willing and eager to just die for the Lord. We'll die for you, Lord. And they were very emotional and they were very sincere, but none of that carried them. The only thing that carries you in life is the Word of God, Bible doctrine, and your soul. So they were sincere, but it didn't do anything for them. Then all the disciples left him and ran away, and that includes all 11. Judas Iscariot all is already out of the picture. And John, he comes back first. He runs away, but then he comes back and follows the Lord from a distance. And actually, John gets to record the first trial uh, of our Lord. Matthew uh, gets to record the second trial. John records the first one. And that's because he ran at first, but then he followed Jesus from a distance, just as uh, Peter will. And he'll get to see the first trial. But the point from all of this is when you lack the Word of God in your soul, when uh, you lack doctrine, you have no courage. And you might say to yourself, if I were alive back in Jesus' day, I would have never uh, left him. Well, under the circumstances, uh, uh, you may have. And you have to think to yourself, uh, is Bible doctrine number one? Is the Word of God number one? If it's not, then you have already forsaken our Lord. And you're saved, but you already are lukewarm. You're already going to be vomited out of his mouth. If you have uh, not made Bible doctrine number one, you have just as much as done as what Peter's going to do. And you've just, just as much as done what all the disciples have done. And they've left him and they've ran away. And they've been with him for three years, and yet they still haven't learned that much. Now moving on to the trial in 2657. Now the ones who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, of course, this is the second trial. The first trial is recorded in John 18, 12 through 24. And that is when Annas is over the trial. Uh, in this trial we have Caiaphas. And he's the one over the event. And he's the high priest where the experts in the law and the elders had gathered. And this means all the religious people gathered in one place right here. So there's going to be trouble. They're all religious people there and there's Jesus and nothing's going to be fair. And in fact, they're meeting at night time. They should not be meeting at night time. That's against Jewish law. And they're not following Jewish law, not concerned with Jewish law. They're so overcome with hate for our Lord that they uh, are going to ignore their Jew Jewish jurisprudence, uh, which follows pretty close to ours. There has to be two witnesses, etc. And uh, the Jewish jurisprudence does follow pretty close to what ours does today. 2658, but Peter was following him from a distance. And remember, this is the second trial. Uh, the first trial, John was following. Now uh, Peter catches up and he's going to go to the second trial. But Peter was following him from a distance all the way to the courtyard of the high priest. After going in, he sat with the officers to see the outcome. He just sat down along with the officers of the court who were, uh, you, know, you know how it is, there's officers of the court and then there's people who watch the proceedings. And Peter is the one who's going to sit there along with others and watch the proceedings. Then in 2659, the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin in this trial was held at night. And we notice several things here. There's no counsel for Jesus Christ. In other words, he has no lawyer. 
Even Saddam Hussein is given a lawyer. In fact, today they gave Saddam Hussein until November something. And it might seem ridiculous, but they're following jurisprudence. But they're not going to follow jurisprudence all in one night. They're going to condemn our Lord all in one night. And uh, they've done it before, and they're going to do it now. And uh, what we see from this is he has no defense. It's held at night, which means it's illegal. And they're also attempting to procure perjury by having a whole bunch of people get up and testify. And there are so many of them that are willing to perjure themselves just to convict our Lord of whatever they can in order that he will be executed. That's how deep the hatred of religion was toward Jesus Christ. And today that's how deep the hatred is of religion toward grace. If you ever wonder why you're attacked when you follow grace, well, just remember, religion attacks grace, always will. And religion in this case is attacking Jesus Christ. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were trying to find two false witnesses. And that's according to the Jewish law. They had to have two witnesses agree with each other before there could be any conviction. Two false witnesses against Jesus so that they could put him to death. They're just seeking to put him to death. And they're just going, they're going through many, many, many different people. And uh, many of those people are perjuring themselves and they can't find two to agree on anything. But finally they did in 2660. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. And the fact that many false witnesses came forward mean that many people were willing to perjure themselves. And the Jews had harsh penalties for perjury. Because a law breaks down if you allow perjury, if you allow hearsay. And they want all the hearsay they can get in the courtroom. If we allow hearsay in our court's room, in our courtrooms, it would fall apart immediately. Because all the gossips who hate the person will come up and make up anything. And that's why we have laws against perjury. And, and the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, jurisprudence had severe penalty for perjury. And, uh, well, I won't comment on a former president, but perjury is a terrible crime. And it was a terrible crime then, yet they're trying to make some, they're trying to make these people perjure themselves and they don't care. They just want two witnesses so that they can put Jesus Christ to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward, and who knows how long this trial had been going through the night. But finally, two came forward, and then in 2661, and said, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And they were grasping at straws. Finally, they found these two people because this is a true statement. This is absolutely correct. Because Jesus Christ was talking about himself. Jesus Christ said, I can destroy the temple. And the temple refers to his own uh, body. And rebuild it in three days. And that refers to the resurrection. I shouldn't have worn long sleeves, but oh well. And that refers, it's October, you would think it would be a little cooler. But, um, but they did not find any. Finally, two came forward. And I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The fact that he can uh, destroy it. He wasn't even talking about the temple. Any assault against the temple, by the way, is uh, considered a crime. And I don't mind. Can you hear back there? Okay. And then in 2662, So the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you have no answer? What is this that they are testifying against you? And the judge, the high priest, is the judge in this case. He's already biased. He already wants a a conviction against Jesus Christ as being guilty. That's what he's seeking. But Jesus remained silent, and that's part of Scripture, because as a lamb before the shearers is dumb, so will Jesus Christ not say a word. So he didn't say a word. 
Then the high priest said to him, and he's getting pretty hot by now, because he's the judge, he's the one in authority, and he says, I charge you under oath by the living God. In other words, I charge you under oath by yourself. He's referring to Jesus Christ, Jehovah, and that's, uh, that's what they always referred to in the Jewish law. They referred to the ruler of Israel, Jesus Christ. So he says, I charge you under oath by yourself. But they didn't know they were saying that. They said, by the living God, which is hilarious. I can imagine Jesus Christ cracking a smile. He is the living God. But the circumstances are so intense, I doubt he cracked a smile. So I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he's under oath now. And uh, by the way, this isn't part of law, because, uh, or especially not part of Jewish jurisprudence, because uh, you, are, you, do, you have the right not to incriminate yourself. And he's saying, incriminate yourself. Basically, what he's telling him telling him to do is, that, are you the Son of God? But Jesus, uh, he already knows he's going to the cross, and he knows this is just a show, and he's already uh, settled it in his mind. So he's going to answer truthfully. He's not going to perjure himself. Uh, many of us, if we're in a tight spot, might perjure ourselves. But our Lord, being perfect, is not going to perjure himself, even though he's not guilty of anything. Not guilty of a thing. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Mm -hmm. In other words, affirmative. That's the way they said it in the Greek. You've said it yourself. In other words, affirmative. Yes, I'm the Son of God. And then he completely goes outside of the trial and actually goes beyond the cross after, after actually he's uh, thinking in the future, in the future tense, and he's not... Uh, uh, what he's doing is actually he's letting the humans there who are there along with the angelic host who are there watching the trial. And Satan's there watching and so are the angels watching and so are uh, other humans uh, who have not yet believed in Christ. And so he just simply skips, uh, well he, he knows he's going to the cross and he simply goes to a future day after the cross has happened. And he tells them this, but I tell you, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man. The Son of Man is referring to himself, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in humanity. From now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. That's at the right hand of God the Father. The power is the omnipotence of God the Father. Omnipotence means all-powerful. And so he sits at the right hand of power. That's the power of, of God the Father. And coming on the clouds of heaven. This is a reference to the second advent. And he's saying, uh, well, what he's telling them is, yes, I'm the Son of God. And you will see me sitting at the right hand of uh, power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That air condition sounds irritating. You can please cut it off because I can sweat. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all to sweat as long as you... Was it a spider? <laughs> but anyway... Now we have some, but when he says, and I'm coming on the clouds of heaven, that means uh, the second advent. That's a reference to the fact that faith rested. That's a reference to the fact that, uh, <laughs> that the Jesus Christ is uh, going to come uh, down uh, from the clouds in the second advent and completely wipe out all the believers. Then in 2665. 2665, and this is uh, quite funny here. Uh, you won't see it as funny yet, but you will in a moment. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? Now you have heard the blasphemy. Now he's a judge, remember. The high priest here is acting as a judge. He tore his clothes. We all remember uh, the trial of uh, O.J. Simpson. And uh, we might remember Judge Ito, that little Asian man. Some of you may be too young to remember him. But everybody was glued to the TV of 
seeing if O.J. Simpson would be found guilty or not. Now imagine little Judge Ito ripping his clothes and saying, You're guilty! And just, rah, and just going crazy like that. Well, this is a judge going crazy, ripping his clothes off, tearing his clothes. And just imagine being in a courtroom. You see, judges are supposed to be impartial, and judges are supposed to uh, sit and watch the trial and make sure, and be even-handed and make sure each side gets their point across and then let the jury decide. But in this case, the judge is so angry, he just stands up and rips his clothes and says, This man's guilty. And maybe Judge Ito should have done that, but... Uh, no, that's not the way jurisprudence works. So it shows what a sham this is, although nobody would want to see that little Asian man rip his clothes. But that's what the high priest did. It's quite funny, and I can see there are people there watching this, including Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is going to watch the first three trials of this, and he's watching this, and uh, in his mind, I'll just give you a preview of coming attractions, in his mind, he starts blaming himself for it all. He says, this is all occurring because of what I've done. And he starts to get really emotional. And when he sees the judge rip, stand up and rip his clothes, and he sees how unfair all this is, well, not even, uh, not even Judas Iscariot, with his low standards, can stand watching this. And even with his low standards, he knows it's a sham, and he starts to feel very, very guilty. And he will see this uh, in a moment, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Then in 2666, after uh, the judge rips his clothes, he looks at the jury and says, What is your verdict? There's no influence here, obviously. What is your verdict? And they answered, He is guilty and deserves death. And they kept on answering that, so they said it over and over again. It was more like a mob action type court, and it was nothing that Jewish, uh, Jewish prudence would ever allow. But in this case, they uh, bent the rules quite a bit, and we'll see a lot of bending of the rules in here because uh, religion so hates Jesus Christ, they'll find any means possible uh, in order to execute him. Then in 2667, this is another thing that's not allowed in Jewish jurisprudence, and that is violence. They did not avow, allow violence. But after they answered with their verdict, then they spat in his face, so he became covered in saliva. It's quite, quite gross to think about it. And not only did they spat in his face, but they punched him. And some slapped him. So I, I imagine the men punched him and the women went by and slapped him. And then they said, prophesy for us, you Messiah, who hit you? Very, it was, they're, they're very ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. And Jesus Christ notes this later. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They are actually beating up the Messiah. Uh, and they don't know that in eternity past, our Lord knew each and every one of those people that would go up and spit on him. He knew them. Knew them by name, knew when they would be born, knew when they would die, knew if they would ever believe, knew if they were going to hell, knew if they were going to heaven, knew everything about them. And so they would spit on him and punch him and slap him and say, Prophesy you, Messiah, who hit you? And uh, they didn't believe he was the Messiah, and they didn't believe that he knew who they were. But he knew each and every one of them. And even though they spit on him, even though they slapped him, even though they punched him, he went to the cross for them. And he, uh, knowing uh, some of these people, he didn't get angry when they punched him. And uh, he was being beaten to a bloody pulp, by the way. And they weren't uh, being soft on him. They were being very harsh. And they beat him so hard that he became unrecognizable. That's why we have in Isaiah the fact that he became ugly. He wasn't ugly to start with. They beat him into ugliness. And a swollen face and everything else. And... Uh, 
but and even knowing the, he had no revenge motivation whatsoever against these people. He followed the royal honor code to a T, and not only did he follow it to a T, he was willing to still go to the cross and die for their sins, including their sins of anger, including their sins of violence against himself. And little did they know, those punches and those little slaps on the face and them spitting on him, that was, a, that was just a minor detail to our Lord. What really, really was the painful thing that came to our Lord was our sins being imputed to him and judged. All of our sins, including their sins and the sins of all human history from the beginning of human history till the end. That was the most painful And even though this was painful, he was unfazed by it. And now uh, Matthew just completely switches. He goes, uh, he he, uh, decides to stop talking about the trial. And now he's going to talk about Peter. Because he had mentioned Peter before. And remember, we've been oscillating between Jesus Christ and Peter. And we saw, and and what uh, Matthew's trying to do is show us that uh, Jesus Christ handles all of this. Why? Because he knows the Word of God and his humanity. Because he's utilizing the unique spiritual life. He's able to handle all of this with grace and patience and with all of those things related to the virtue and the spiritual life. And he opens not his mouth. He doesn't uh, curse. He doesn't curse them out when uh, he's punched. And uh, that's because he's following God's plan. And so, and then it switches to Peter, and we're going to see how Peter handles the situation. And uh, Peter's not going to do too well. 2669. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A slave girl. I don't know what your translation says. Maybe a uh, maidservant. It's a slave girl. A slave girl came to him and said, You were with Jesus, the Galilean, too. She recognized him. And uh, she had probably been observant of Jesus and seen Peter walk behind Jesus or walk around Jesus or talk to Jesus. And so, now that everybody's worked up, she sees Peter and says, You were with that man. But he denied it in front of all of them, saying... I don't know what you're talking about. Just brushed her off. You're just a little slave girl. I don't even know what you're talking about. You're crazy. And then uh, 2671. When he went out of the gateway, he left her. It disturbed him that she called him on it. And so he left immediately. When he went out to the gateway, another slave girl saw him and said to the people there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. So somebody else recognized him. And this time he denies it by an oath. He's not cussing yet, but he's denying it by an oath. And you know what an oath is. By my grandmother's grave, I would never, I never would do such a thing. Well, this is Peter's oath. By my grandmother's grave, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And he's getting even more forceful about it. And then he uh, goes away from that area. Then after a little while, those standing there came up to Peter and said, You really are one of them too, because your accent shows it clearly. That's what it means by speech or whatever it says in your Bible. He has an accent. And uh, and, he, and they say, your accent shows it clearly that you uh, have been following Christ. 26.74. At that, he began to curse. And that's a truly what he did. He began to cuss. And the cuss words aren't recorded, so I won't even elaborate. But you know cuss words, and you could throw some in there. But it's not part of the Word of God. And he said, I do not know the man. And then add in a few of your own favorite cuss words. And that's about what Peter was saying. I do not know the man. And immediately, immediately the rooster crowed. Now before all of this, Peter wasn't even thinking about what our Lord had said before. He's not thinking. He's emoting. And he's not even thinking about the fact that our Lord had already told him, Look, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. And Peter said, Oh no, I'll even die with you. And he gets all emotional and says, I'll die with you if I have to. 
and then he denies him three times and completely forgets anything that our Lord said. That's what happens when we get emotional. We completely forget the Word of God. When we get emotional, we don't apply the Word of God. And neither is Peter here. And and the reason why our Lord gave him a sign such as the rooster crowing was so that he could orient himself back to doctrine. But he's emotional right now, very emotional. And that's because Peter is easily discouraged. Peter is uh, Peter followed our Lord, and uh, he knew our Lord. He knew he was the Son of God. He even said so. He said, "You are the Son of God." And then he was praised for doing that. And then after that, he got such a big head for a long time. And then he started failing once again because he's easily discouraged. And when he sees this trial. He's discouraged. And then uh, he knows the outcome. He, he looks at our Lord and he says, there's just no hope. They're going to kill him. And if I don't, they're going to kill me too. And emotional people, by the way, this is a principle, emotional people or people who are, have a tendency to get emotional, and we all do, including myself, but they, when you get emotional, you have a tendency to be discouraged very easily. And Peter was discouraged. And then the rooster crowed, and that uh, brought him back around to remembering something. 2675, he didn't even remember it. He had just denied him three times. He went through it once, and then twice with someone else, and then three times. And then the third time he's cussing up a storm. He doesn't even recall anything that our Lord said. And then when the rooster crows, he remembers. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now there is legitimate weeping that is not bitter, and we went over the doctrine of weeping, I believe. And there's legitimate weeping in which, uh, for example, if your country goes under and the courageous men weep. That's legitimate. And uh, in a lot of a lot of especially men, they like to uh, say they're tough. I I don't cry about anything, and they're they're a liar. Even men cry, and uh, sometimes it's legitimate crying. When I hear the national anthem, I get choked up, and that's legitimate. But Peter is bitter, and he wept bitterly because he was so discouraged. He was seeing what our Lord was going through, and he. And then he was seeing that he was getting caught up in it. He didn't want to get caught up in it and die. And he didn't want our Lord to die either. And so he becomes very bitter and he weeps bitterly because he remembers what the Lord said. And also there's going to be guilt involved with that. So he went outside and wept bitterly. We can understand why. If we were there at the same time and we had done the same thing, we would go outside and weep bitterly because you just denied the Lord three times, just like you said you were going to do. And uh, we can understand Peter's emotional response. But he just went from being emotional to being more emotional. Then finally, it's not recorded here because we're going to switch from Peter to uh, Jesus being brought before Pilate. But uh, Peter rebounds. We know this because later he writes First and Second Peter. And by the way, Mark was probably Peter's account of what uh, happened uh, during Christ's life on the earth. Because uh, Peter didn't know Greek very well, especially starting out. And uh, Mark is very elliptical, just like uh, Peter is in First and Second Peter. And if you ask anyone who knows Greek, they'll tell you that First and Second Peter are the hardest to translate because uh, Peter's Greek was it, it would be like having bad English grammar, kind of hard to follow, and very elliptical, meaning he left out a lot of verbs. And another reason why he started leaving out a lot of verbs, especially in the second epistles, because he's dying. And he's got a lot to say in a short time, and so he just uh, leaves out verbs everywhere. It becomes very difficult to translate. But if you know Peter and you know what he's trying to say, you can. So, uh, that's what happened to Peter. And he rebounded and later, and rebounded means he named his sins. He named his sin of denying Christ three times after he finished weeping bitterly. 
And he named his sin. He got back with it. Got back with the Word of God. And it won't be too much longer after this until Peter will be preaching himself. And he'll be standing up on the day of Pentecost preaching. But then he'll be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And then Peter will shoot toward the high ground. And he won't go as far as Paul, but he'll go far enough. And, uh, well, he'll go far enough to where he's going to receive a lot of rewards. Now in 27 verse 1, Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate. When it was early in the morning on Wednesday, they had just held that trial uh, Tuesday night, now it's Wednesday morning. All the chief priests and elders of the people assembled together to plot against Jesus and to execute him. So they went through their phony trial and found him guilty. And they want to execute him. But there, there's a problem in, their, in them executing our Lord because uh, of the fact that uh, it's, it's a Passover time. The Jews can't execute people during Passover. It's forbidden by Jewish law. And during Passover, every type of business ceases, including the business of uh, law enforcement, uh, and including uh, uh, execution. So they can't do this themselves. They can't uh, execute Jesus themselves because they're so religious, they're going to have to follow the Passover. They're going to have to follow their religious holidays. So they're still adhering to their religion. Then in 27.2, they tied him up, led him away, and handed him over to Pontius Pilate, the procreator. The procurator. Now, uh, Pontius Pilate is was the ruler of the third class province of Judea, and it was considered a third class province. That's because Judea was poor. They're under the fourth cycle of discipline. God has been punishing them and punishing them and punishing them, trying to get them to wake up, trying to get them to wake up to the fact of uh, that Jesus Christ was there, trying to get them to believe in Christ, trying to get them to get with doctrine. They're under the fourth cycle of discipline. And not only that, and because of that, they've already went through the third cycle. And when they went through the third cycle, that devastated them economically. So they're a poor province, ruled by Rome and ruled by Pontius Pilate. And being a third-class province, uh, Pontius Pilate didn't much care for the people there. Because they were poor. And uh, Pontius Pilate was an aristocrat. He was used to being around wealthy people. And he just kind of looked down his nose at all the Jews. And a natural hatred developed between Pontius Pilate and all the religious leaders, including all the Jews. The Jews hated Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate didn't much like them either. But the Jews really hated Pontius Pilate because he was a Roman. He worshipped other gods. He would, have a, he would hold a golden shield that was shaped kind of like a door. And it would have an eagle on it and maybe a picture of a god or something else. And the Jews just despised that. They, they, uh, they, they believed in one God, God the Father, but they couldn't come to believe in Jesus Christ. And when they saw all of these Romans with all of their uh, for, uh, foreign gods coming in and they worshipped many, many different gods, and then they became uh, angry against that, and they would always start up little revolts against uh, Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate had been uh, berated several times by Tiberius, who was back in uh, Rome. And Tiberius would, uh, for example, one thing uh, Pontius Pilate did is he, uh, one time, he just took all the money, out, not all of it, a portion of the money out of the temple and decided to build an aqueduct and to bring in water for the Jews. It was the best investment he could have ever made. But when he took it from the temple, it was like uh, uh, taking it from their holy place, and uh, they had a little revolt because of it. And then Tiberius said, you idiot, you need to stop messing with these Jews like this. Keep them happy. And he would always get letters from Tiberius. Keep them happy. Keep them happy. But uh, Pontius Pilate started out in his youth as a tough man. And uh, when the Jews would do something, he would uh, respond harshly. Uh, sometimes he uh, would kill them. 
And when they would revolt, just wipe them out. Probably the best way to deal with a revolt. That's the way he thought of it. But every time he tried to uh, function on his own, he would get reprimanded by Rome. And so now this thing comes up before Pontius Pilate. And now he has a chance to be a great ruler, but he's going to fail because of expediency. He he doesn't want any more trouble from the Jews, and this is just one more problem that he's going to have. And he doesn't want any more retribution or any more letters coming from Rome, and he's going to uh, he's going to fall all apart during this and do the wrong thing. And he's in hell today because he would never believe in Jesus Christ. That's the main reason, the only reason he would never believe in Jesus Christ. That's why he's in hell today. Uh, but he became weak and expedient. Uh, But uh, what I'm trying to tell you here is the fact that uh, the Jews hated Pontius Pilate. Especially the religious Jews. Especially those ones who are uh, bringing this case to Pontius Pilate. They hate him, but they hate the Lord more. So they're willing to go to Pontius Pilate and let him deal with it. And they're willing to pay homage to Pontius Pilate. And they're willing to talk to him in order to destroy the Lord. They hate Jesus Christ more than Pontius Pilate. And they really hate Pontius Pilate. So from this you should begin to almost feel the seething rage from the religious crowd. They absolutely despise our Lord. And you say, well, why? Why do they despise the Lord so much? Why do they hate the Lord so much? Well, if you've been studying with me, you should realize that uh, our Lord's been tough on them the whole way. Saying, you're going to hell. You're worse than prostitutes. You're worse than tax collectors. And uh, unless you believe in me, you're going to hell. And they've been seething and they've been bottling this rage up for three years now. And now that they've got him, they think, well, we've got it. So we'll, we, we hate him so much, we'll even uh, pay homage to Pontius Pilate, whom we hate. Because we hate the Lord more. And then Matthew skips from uh, Pontius Pilate to Judas Iscariot. And he's going to cover Judas, Judas's suicide. 27 verse 3. Now when Judas, who betrayed him... Now he had, having seen the first three trials, he's seen the first three trials. Now when Judas, who betrayed him, having seen the first three trials, saw that he had been condemned. Now uh, this isn't uh, seeing the Lord being, he's seeing himself being condemned. This is the Greek word kata krino. K-A-T-A. K R I N O. Katakrino. And this is strong in the Greek. Uh, he condemned himself uh, to the point of having an extraordinary guilt complex. He had a guilt complex. He felt guilty about what he did. He felt very guilty. And that was based on his own norms and standards. He had violated his own norms and standards, which were very low. Because remember Judas Iscariot, and from John, we know that Judas Iscariot was the treasurer and stole from the treasury. And uh, Judas Iscariot, uh, throughout his whole life, had uh, one God, and that was money. He loved money. And that's why he went for the 30 coins of silver. But even before that, he was stealing from the treasury. And he loved money, and that's what he always thought about. And because he loved money so much, and because money was his God, he never came to think about Jesus Christ as being his Savior, and he never believed in Jesus Christ. He was too focused on a detail of life as an unbeliever. And as an unbeliever, the detail of his life that he loved more than anything else was money. And he loved it. And he had just received 30 pieces of silver. And you would think that if the only thing you ever loved in life was money, after receiving such a large sum of reward, you would think he would be happy. But the details of life don't make you happy. And they didn't make him happy. And he he reacted with a guilt complex. 
Now this applies to believers as well. If you put anything above Bible doctrine and then uh, uh, suddenly, well, if you put anything above Bible doctrine, whatever it may be, TV show, money, anything, then uh, you're just like Judas Iscariot except uh, you're saved. You're in carnality though and you are out of fellowship and you are serving another God. And uh, that's really what it means when you make Bible doctrine number 2, number 3, number 10, whatever you make it, uh, you have to replace it with something else and when you do so, it's as if you're worshiping another God. Now in Israel, they would worship, actually worship other gods. And you say, we don't do that today. Well, we're too sophisticated, etc. We don't worship uh, gods of wood and gold and silver and all that. Uh, gods made by hand. But if you uh, would rather watch a television show than learn the Word of God, or not that what, not, when you want, don't get legalistic. You can watch all the television you want as long as you make enough time and put it aside for the Word of God. And you can, uh, you see, you have to have balance in life. You have to have work and you have to have play. But you always have to have doctrine. And uh, one hour a day is sufficient enough. And it really doesn't put that much of a crimp in your life. Unless you have the wrong standards, then it does. If you don't, if you have the wrong standards, then one hour a day is uh, like an eternity. And you're just not going to want to do it. And you, you'll replace it with something else. Your God television show. Your God, whatever you, whatever you think is more important than doctrine is your God. And that is, uh, and you're a believer, but you can still go that route. Now, Judas Iscariot is an unbeliever, and his God's been money his whole life. And it never made him happy. And finally, it's, it's coming to roost for him. Uh, pardon the expression, uh, being we just talked about roosters. But uh, now... It, it, he's really miserable. And the more money he accumulated, the more miserable he got. And he did this thing and he condemned himself by his own standards, his own norms and standards. And then we have the word metamelamai. Well, first of all, your uh, English translation, if you have a uh, King James Version, is Judas repented. Now, I would like to... Uh, ask a lot of Baptist preachers about this. Look here, Judas repented. Man, old Judas, he repented. He got saved. Hallelujah. And they would they would have a hard time with that. Judas Iscariot got saved. He repented. Uh, but, hey, it says in the King James inspired version, he repented. So he repented. And you ask all your congregation to repent. And, if, and he even... Uh, I mean, he repented so bad he hung himself. See, they would never, uh, they would never see it that way, and they don't even know what repent means. If you ever brought it up, they would uh, poo-poo it, because they're not interested in what the Word of God has to say, and they're not interested in what repent really means. Now, in the Greek, there's metanoiao. Meta means to change. Noiao means mind, thinking, to change your thinking. Now, if uh, Judas had changed his thinking about Christ, he would have believed in him. But Judas Iscariot has built up so much scar tissue, he's not going to change his thinking about Christ. But he is going to change his feelings. And that's where we get metamelomai. M-E-T-A, M-E-L-O-M-A-I. Meta means to change. And then we have melomai. And that means to change your feelings. And he had a change of feelings. Boy, did he ever. He, uh, probably when he first got the 30 uh, silver coins, well, he hadn't even spent them yet, which shows uh, probably what a, a thrift uh, he was, or whatever you call him. What, uh, frugal. He was frugal, but uh, he, what do you call somebody who's stingy and just holds on to their money no matter how much they got in them? Uh, uh, frugal or whatever, just a penny pincher is what he was, and he still had these 30 coins, and when he first got them, he was probably pretty happy, got these 30 coins, and then uh, after a while he had a metamelomai, a change of feeling, he had seen the three trials, and uh, he started to blame himself, and he said, looks like uh, 
He never thought the Lord would go to the cross, is what it's saying. And he's thinking to himself, it looks like the Lord's going to be crucified, except he didn't call him the Lord. He would probably say, looks like my rabbi, my teacher, looks like my rabbi is about to get crucified. And he'd been with him for three years, and so he had an emotional reaction. And he felt sorry for himself uh, because, uh, and he started to blame himself if, if he had done it all. Now he might have uh, uh, some blame in it, and you would think you would uh, you would probably put some blame on yourself. But the only thing he had to do was believe in Jesus Christ, and all that blame would have been wiped out. Jesus Christ uh, willingly went to the cross, and for him to even take blame for it uh, shows his unbelief. Now he's taking all the credit for Jesus Christ even going to the cross. Jesus Christ going to the cross because he, he's going to follow God's plan. And Judas Iscariot doesn't understand God's plan. He doesn't understand that Jesus Christ has to go to the cross to be judged as a substitute for everyone. He's an unbeliever. He doesn't understand anything spiritual, so he blames himself for it all. And he says, I, I'm the reason why this innocent man's going to die. He knows he's innocent. But uh, he never does recognize him as Lord. He never believes in him. So he felt guilty about what he had done, and that's metamelomai. And that's the corrected translation. Now when Judas, who had betrayed him, having seen the first trials, saw that he had been condemned by his own norms and standards, that's the Greek word katakrino, he had been condemned by his own norms and standards, which were low, which shows uh, that uh, he stooped real low. He felt guilty, metamelomai. Felt guilty, guilt complex. Not metanoieo. He did not change his mind. He felt guilty about what he had done. And, hey, look at this, retribution. And returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priest and elders. What we have uh, Judas doing here is what a lot of uh, preachers tell their people to do. First of all, uh, feel sorry about your sin. Feel guilty. Weep tears of repentance at the altar, just like Judas. He wasn't at an altar, but he's weeping tears of uh, repentance, except it's a metal metal by, and he's weeping tears of emotion. Yes, he is. And that's one thing he did. And guess what else he does? He, he acknowledges his sin. 27.4 Saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Well, Judas Iscariot acknowledged that he had sinned. But you're not saved by acknowledging that you have sinned. That's post-salvation. No one's ever been saved by acknowledging that they were sinners. Well, of course you're a sinner. Everybody knows that. Well, you could go up to a Jew and say, are you a sinner? And they'll say, yes. Just about everybody will acknowledge that except some kooky Christians who think that since they believe they haven't sinned ever since, and they're full of it. So he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So he confessed his sin. So what? He's an unbeliever. So as an unbeliever, he confessed his sin. As an unbeliever, he made retribution by giving back the 30 silver coins. As an unbeliever, he felt sorry for his sins. As an unbeliever, he wept tears of repentance. He met a metal mind. And guess what? After all of that, he was still an unbeliever. He did not metanoia, change his thinking. But they said, now this is something, 27.4, saying uh, he's going up to the chief priest. He's actually acknowledging his sins to other people. And that impresses a lot of churches today as well. So he goes up to the the chief uh, priest and all of those who he took the money from, and he said, uh, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood, acknowledging that he was wrong by his own norms and standards. But they said... And this is literally what they said from the Greek. They got pretty irritated with Judas Iscariot because they have such hatred for Jesus Christ. And uh, he's the one that betrayed them. And then uh, they already gave him the 30 silver coins. And so he's irritated them by coming up and saying this man's innocent. 
And Judas Iscariot just offended the religious crowd for the first time in his own life. And they said to him, That's your own damn business. And that's exactly the way it comes out in the Greek. That shows how cruel and how harsh religion is. Well, first of all, they're very hypersensitive towards self. If anybody offends them, they'll be sure to gossip and rip them apart and to make sure that they are uh, become, uh, uh, or at least uh, get trampled under their feet. So they're hypersensitive toward themselves, religious people, but insensitive toward others. And they were hypersensitive when Jesus chewed them out. They got hypersensitive. But they're not sensitive toward Jesus, are they? They watch him get beat to a pulp and they love every minute of it. And then they see Judas uh, weeping and having a horrible time uh, with the, what he had done by his own norms and standards. And they're not compassionate. And they don't say, well now, boy, uh, we're sorry this had to come to pass. Uh, we'll take your money back. Sorry. No, they said, uh, that's your own damn business. In other words, leave us alone. So Judas threw down the silver coins into the temple and left. There's his retribution. So he's uh, really taken cognizance of the fact that he has sinned. So what? As an unbeliever taking cognizance of the fact that you have sinned does not make you saved. The only way of salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. So Judas has confessed his sins to others, not to God. But even if he did it to God, God wouldn't hear it because he's not saved. He's felt guilty. He's confessed. He's done everything that a lot of churches around here and around the country and around the world would say would uh, give him a ticket to heaven. I'd like to ask a Baptist preacher about this sometime. What about the, he repented? Look, man, he repented. But then after he repented, what did he do? <laughs> so Judas threw down the silver coins into the temple and left. And then after he went through all that rigmarole, what did he do? Went out and hanged himself. Committed suicide. I'd like to ask a Baptist preacher, how can somebody repent and then immediately go and commit suicide? What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. A lack of knowledge of doctrine. And they don't know the difference between metanoiao and metamentalmai. And they don't know the difference between changing your mind about Christ and having an emotional reaction to something you've done wrong. And they think that if somebody has an emotional reaction to something they've done wrong and come forward and cry and give their lives over to Christ, that they're saved. And they're not. They're not even close to being saved. They're just like Judas Iscariot and they're going to burn in hell forever. And Judas Iscariot hung himself after all that rigmarole. And he went to hell. Not because he hung himself. He felt bad about what he did. Betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way out, he was in such mental torment, the only way out for him was to hang himself. And then he went to hell and he had even more torment. It's a sad story. And that's why Jesus Christ said it would have been better for him not to have been born. Because his, his life is a tragedy. His whole life is a tragedy. He loves money so much and he never gets happiness out of money. And then he goes and hangs himself commits suicide, and then he goes to hell. It been better for somebody like that not to be born, wouldn't you think? Terrible tragedy, but by his own volition, that's what he did. And then note this in 27.6. The chief priest took the silver and said, It is not lawful to put this into the temple treasury, since it is blood money. Now they're worried about what is lawful since it is blood money. In other words, they're recognizing it as blood money, recognizing it as money to betray someone who is innocent. And they're recognizing all of that and calling it blood money. And even though they uh, permit all this and encourage all this, uh, they're not going to, uh, well, they can't have any. they're not going to put it in the treasury because it's blood money. 
it's actually, it's funny how they stick so closely with the law. And this law is found in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy, sorry, Deuteronomy uh, 23. And it lists the kinds of money that can't go into the treasury. And they know the law to a T. And they say, oh, this money can't go into the treasury. It's, uh, it's uh, the way most people are today, really, in terms of religion. They'll follow their religion to a T. They'll uh, they'll even they'll say, "Well, I won't do any work on Sunday whatsoever," and then Monday through uh, Saturday gossip about the next door neighbor. It's the same concept. They're following some type of rule, some type of law, and while they're covered in dung, and this is what the, these religious people are covered in dung, and they follow all these rules, and yet they don't even know the way of salvation. 27.7 After consulting together, they bought the potter's field with it as a burial place for foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah, and it was actually spoken by Zechariah. And the reason why it says by Jeremiah is because of the scrolls. The top of the scroll, they would uh, they do the scrolls differently than what we have in our Bibles. At the top of the scroll uh, was the name Jeremiah, uh, but uh, Jeremiah had just ended his uh, thing. And then at the bottom was Zechariah, and Zechariah had, be- had begun his thing in the scroll. And actually, this is Zechariah where this comes from. Not Jeremiah, but they just say Jeremiah because of the way the scrolls were written. Uh, the same way if... Uh, well, it's the same way as if we had uh, Matthew move over just a little bit into uh, uh, some other book. And uh, if for some reason that occurred. And then we would just recognize it that way and not say anything about it. Uh, or a better uh, analogy would be the same way we have numbers that correspond to the verses here. They're not in the original. And so we say 27.5. Somebody reading a scroll wouldn't know where to get 27.5. They wouldn't know where it was. If you said uh, somebody reading a scroll and you were to say uh, Matthew 27.9 turned there, they wouldn't know how. There was no numbers. It was just a book, just written. And so how they had numbered it and how they had labeled it, well, people had come to call it Jeremiah, but actually it was Zechariah, and that's all there was to it. So the prophet of the Zechariah was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price of the one whose estimated value had been set by the people of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. And uh, we'll have explanation for all of this uh, tomorrow. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.